Knicks fans of the round table. The round table debate show hosted for the fans by the fans. Today's episode, the end of the season wrap up, the good, the bad, the ugly. Joining me today, my partner, Jay Ellis from the Nick of Time Show. JB from the Knicks Film School. Jonathan Macri from the Knicks Film School. Fellas, how's it going today, man? Going good. Good, We're good. all watching the Tiger in the background. I yeah. Guess yeah. <laughs> yeah, I apologize to any viewers if my, if my vision veers off to the sides because I'm watching Tiger Woods. Right Talk, talking hoops, <laughs> watching golf, man. All, all good, man. But um, listen, this is about a 17-65 and 65 season. We've made it to the end. It's finally here. It's it's been a it's been a long season, but you know who else could make seventeen and sixty five look so good? But the New York Knicks. <laughs> we we go through so many ups and downs, so much drama, so much highlights and lowlights. I mean, I say it all the time, man. We we have a season's worth of news that the average <laughs> team doesn't experience for about five seasons. Yep. You know, this was a light year, though. That's the funny part. Oh man, I I thought it was a heavy year, man. I, oh, I no. thought it was a heavy year, man. The, the KP trade was a blockbuster. I mean, well, yeah, 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 I guess. So. The, the, I, I, you know what it is? Unbasketball related drama, I would say. Well, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, which is which is the Knicks, isn't it? So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Yankees. I think they say it about right. They play 162 one game seasons. That's basically the Knicks. That's it, man. Game seasons. That that's basically it, man. So so let's start off with the good. You know, obviously there was a lot of losing. To, to be had this season, but there was there was certainly um, some some highlights of the season. JB, I'll, I'll kick it off with you, man. What were some of your favorite moments uh, of this 2018-2019 campaign? Well, I mean, I think it's the one I'm guessing all of us would say, and that's the emergence of Mitch. We were all excited about him. I think we did a preview show, I think, where we, you know, we talked about what we look forward to the season, and we probably mentioned him as an add-on. Yes. But it was about, you know, Knox uh what's frank gonna do in his second year things like that i don't think anyone no matter how optimistic you were thought okay this guy by the end of the season is going to show signs that he could be a generational shot blocker he could legit be that piece that teams like you know golden state or san antonio get lucky finding in the second round Mm -hmm. the knicks actually got lucky finding in the second round so to me, you know, this whole season, while we have the off-court stuff and the Porzingis trade and clearing the cap space, you know, I think the emergence of Mitch in terms of on-court uh, significance is the biggest thing we'll look back on. A- absolutely, man. JLS Mitch finished with two and a half blocks on average, 161 total blocks, a Knicks rookie record, 29 consecutive games with two or more blocks, which is the second longest streak by a rookie in NBA history. 38 consecutive games with one block, which is a Knicks rookie record. Yep. I, I mean, this, this was Ninja P, wasn't it? F- finding a steal with the 36th pick of the draft, man. What, what were your what were your takes on Mitch and, and some of your highlights of this season? Yeah, man. Like, uh, to, to piggyback off what JB was talking about, I loved what Mitch did for us this season. Um, the, the blocks were one thing. We, we all saw some raw talent in Summer League, and I kind of felt like we were missing a defensive presence whatsoever. I felt like he would yeah. be on a team, but no one no one thought that he would have this type of impact. Yep. And even when we saw the glimpses of shot blocking, I think uh, the rebounding towards the second half of the season was kind of what made me go, okay, well, we might actually have a legit starting center coming yeah. into the next season because, like, I, I don't know, remember us talking in the season, he was like, all right, we – our thought was, yo, who do we have to rebound? Yeah. Yeah. We don't have no one to grab rebounds. We was looking at Noah Vonley like, okay, I see his rebounding stats are, are good. But is that going to translate on the Knicks? Um, and then he's like, well, we have to have Cantor because he's the only one who kind of can rebound. And he's trying to mix and match. With Cantor gone and and Vonley having the ankle thing, this comfort knowing that not only can Mitch block some shots, but he can also rebound and – it just seems like, oh, wow, he can maybe – he can legit be a starting center for us next season, and we'd be I mean, fine. <laughs> Macri, how about you, man? I mean, you know, I could I could talk about Mitch, you know, for a long time. I think the, the thing with Mitch, and it's related to, for me to my kind of plus, big plus for this season, 
is that they needed to, the Knicks um, needed to show more than anything this year that they could just competently run an organization. And I think Mitch is, is one of several examples of, okay, this is a guy that I don't, you know, it, it's so long now, but we forget a lot of the draft people were saying around the time of the draft, this kid's success is going to be determined in large part based on where he's drafted. And um, I don't want to call out Sam Vecini, but he was the one that said it. So I, I kind of have to on a podcast. He's like, he's the type of guy that if, you know, you see him with a golden state, he could wind up having maybe a great career as opposed to the, the Knicks. Knicks. And he literally, and he literally <laughs> used the Knicks as an example of we, you know, you don't want to see him going to, to that type of organization. And lo and behold, he did come to the Knicks and not only was he very good, but he got a lot better in significant areas. And well, you know, I don't think that um, the development of the young players across the board was, was perfect this year. And we could get into that. Um, I think by and large, they showed themselves to be like, okay, um, we want to focus on development. And I think they kind of came out um, with more pluses than minuses and just to to a larger extent, um, they got through the whole year like looking okay. Like there were no stupid moves. Like yes, they obviously they traded Porzingis, mm-hmm. but if you look around the league and you listen to what people were saying, everybody agreed. Like yeah, you know what? They did pretty good in that deal. Um, you know, and when you're talking really big picture and and whether or not people are going to want to come here this summer, I think the fact that they just had a very solid season from a front office perspective um i think that matters a lot yeah i i would echo those sentiments on, on the development light you know um certainly some ups and downs with you know say kevin knox but you know the, these guys also knox also had a had a strong end of the season i thought his month yep. of march and yes. april i thought he finished strong we, we saw iso have some have some sunshine back when he was healthy obviously earned his way out of that two-way deal into a uh, regular contract with the Knicks. Also, I think to give credit to, to you know, the development team, they, they seem to have these kids at best interest at heart. You know, they, they put Mitch in front of um, Rasheed Wallace. They put him in front of Marcus Canby. They had Willis Reed talking to him and the team. They paired up Knox with Bernard King. They had Jason Kidd coming in. So clearly their commitment to the development of this key, of these kids was pretty consistent um, year long. Oh, yeah, of course. Like, you, at the beginning of the season, this whole – the whole concept was we're going to get the most – coach-friendly assistance on this team, and we're going to double down on development. And that was the game plan from the, from the jump, with getting Pat Sullivan over and uh, Royal Ivy and all, all the guys who were touted for their, their work with young players and putting them on this one team to see what happens. And it seemed like it worked out for a few of these players. And, um, yeah, you look like a competent team because of it. JB, what, what's your take? You know, Macri brought up, um, he shed light on, on the organization being able to kind of, um, you know, ha- handle things professionally, especially the KP trade. They seem to be able to skirt through the Dolan fiasco uh, fairly well. What, what was your take on how this new management regime kind of handled things this year? Yeah, no, I think that's the one of the biggest areas of improvement uh, we've seen is that, you know, we were joking um, you know, in terms of like, okay, was this a, a, a loud or, or quiet season for the Knicks where it seems like you can never have a quiet season for the Knicks? <clears throat> I think it sort of was when you consider they traded Chris Epps Porzingis, the biggest star that they've had since Patrick Ewing. And then here we are, we found out Friday that Patrick Ewing is going to represent the team at the lottery. Yep. And, you know, it reminds us that during the season, they met with Ewing when they're down in D.C., they had Bernard King talk to mm-hmm. Knox. They brought in a lot of the legends. And I just, I thought it was most symbolic that last home game where there they are, you know, the place is still sold out because mm-hmm. of course it's a garden. I know a lot of that is tourists, et cetera. Oh, yeah. But it's like, here we are the last game of the season, tied for their worst season ever. They're losing by 30 points and nobody is booing and nobody is chanting for anyone to be fired. I don't <laughs> think that- <laughs> that's true. No, that, that's, that's true, but you know, so to me that's something because I, I remember going one of Isaiah Thomas last game as coach 
And I remember being in there and the fire eyes oh, yeah. chant so loud. Oh, and yeah. I, that was when me and my wife are still dating and she wasn't really a big basketball fan. And she's like, I can't believe like they're actually <laughs> <laughs> these you people know? are out for blood in here, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think they did a good job and from that from the standpoint of you know getting through what was really you know an ugly season on the court and then did have the you know um the Porzingis trade to come away where fans are optimistic and feel good I mean that you know that that's that's kind of crazy and 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 I just uh, to piggyback off of that I mean I think we take for granted the fact that um you you could go into a season and plan not to win a lot of games, which the Knicks did. It doesn't mean that um, it's easy or even likely that mm. things won't spiral out of control. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you look at the other bottom tier organization, or not, I don't want to say bottom tier organizations. You look at the other bottom tier teams in terms of win totals this year. Um, the Cavs fired one coach at the beginning of the season and now uh, are, they just let go another coach. The Bulls um, fired a coach earlier this season and then had like a full scale mutiny. A mess. They, and the Bulls were yeah, a no, mess. After they got their new coach on board. <laughs> um, the uh, the Phoenix Suns, like, there was that article that came out um, on ESPN about, about their whole kind of uh, how they, things are not exactly great there from oh, yeah. a, a management structure and, and the coach staff doesn't really know what they're doing. You got the Lakers with their problems, you got the Kings just fired their coach. All, you know, when you miss the playoffs, you know, shit bubbles up, excuse my French, and it, that has not happened here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it really, it cannot be stated enough how, especially when you give it, give uh, attention to how often mm. things have bubbled up, even when there have been decent seasons True. Um, yeah. in, in this particular organization. So, True. yeah. Big it's deal. very weird. People are skipping through flowers and stuff after we have, like, the <laughs> tied <laughs> for the worst. Exactly. Yeah, a- absolutely. <laughs> and we're just like, oh, it's cool. Yeah. It's right. I mean, I mean. Right on track. It's like, really? Is this, is this happening? Okay. What do you guys think? It's me and Macri have talked about this, but it's like, do you think as the fan, like, this is a stuff I guess some people will troll Knicks fans about, but do you think the fans have bought in too much? We've given too much leniency. Like we just said, they did a masterful job getting through this year from like a PR perspective, everything. Is any of that on the fans a little bit that like we're a little too bought into this concept? No, because we're usually not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's the first time I ever could remember that the fans are not like pulling their hair out with the with the losing season so right right i, don't, I think if yeah. you look like the first time of us not pulling our hair out, i said okay well maybe there's a reason this time maybe, yeah. <laughs> right. you know what yeah saying? yeah i i mean i think they've legitimately earned earned those accolades but there's still there's still some detractors you know you have the people that are down on fizz the people that never really wanted fizz here to begin with you have the people that will always 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 hate dolan and you know that the fan getting tossed out of the garden only amplifies that that message i'm still getting retweets off that tmz video with people just yeah. I rate with, with, with T- James Dolan. So, oh, you, you know, there's that. I, I almost feel like I thought about this the other day. Sometimes teams need a certain coach or a certain guy there when you're building it up, and then maybe someone different that to when take you it actually. Forward. Win. And I'm wondering with Fizz, it, you know, especially this year, the fact that all those post games where he's going, they lost, what was it, 17 in a row? That, yeah. That stretch- he, every day he's going, he's answering the press. I mean, I feel like there's no one better equipped than Fizz to do that. And yep. you sort of wonder when you talk about the Fizzdale detractors, we need to learn a little more, you know, how good of a coach is he for an actual winning team? Yeah. Yep. Uh, is it possible, you know, maybe he's the guy that gets us through this kind of dark period and then you do need someone a little more, um, you know, with a better, a different system or a little more tactical. I don't know. I think he's still can prove that he's the guy, but I do think that that is a question I've had. Somebody on my show said the same thing. It was like, they feel like Fizz is the guy who's going to get us through this part, and then we're going to end up hiring Mark Jackson. Oh, year. God, no. Oh, no, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, that was my reaction. Please, please, please don't, man. <laughs> I mean, do, do you guys have, uh, I, and, and Mac, I kind of want to segue this to you. Do you guys sure. have buyer's remorse with Fizz? Especially, I don't, it's it's hard to not to look at Budenholzer. Yes, yes, the Bucks 
have an outstanding roster, man. But it seems like wherever this guy goes, things just turn to gold. I mean, this team is, they're up on their win total by 15 games from last year. Uh, this guy looks like he's going to be coach of the year again this year. You see the job that he did in Atlanta, turning that team around uh, into a 50-plus win team, five-plus all-stars. Um, what, what do you what do you guys think about that? Are you, are you still uh, confident in Fizz going forward or, or what? I, I am. Um, and look, I, I don't, I'm not trying to hide the fact that I've been a big supporter of his all year because mm-hmm. he... <laughs> The most important thing that he needed to do was kind of what's just been said. He needed to put a face on this thing. Mm-hmm. And all due respect to Kenny Atkinson, who did a, a, just an utterly unbelievable job in Brooklyn when he first got there and has continued that. And Lloyd Pierce down in Atlanta. Um, those guys did not have to deal with one tenth of the scrutiny that yeah. comes with being the coach of the New York Knicks. And, um, I, I understand that you could then say, well, you know what? If he didn't make so many questionable decisions, he wouldn't have to deal with as much scrutiny. I don't know about that. And here's why. I don't think anybody, Budenholzer, Popovich, um, you know, John Wooden, could have come in here with this team that it's not that just that they were young. It's not just that they had players that were incredibly flawed. They had incredibly young players and incredibly flawed players. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those things cross-sectioned. Yeah. And and uh, players in transition. Yeah, yeah, and they turned over a lot of their roster in the middle of the year. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know. Like, yeah, sure. Is another, could another coach have come in here and um, maybe gotten a, a, a few more wins, a handful of more wins? Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think anybody would have wanted that. Uh, they got the best lottery odds, um, <laughs> for, you know, which is which is not a bad thing. And they played the kids the whole year. I mean, I'll go back to the stat yeah. that I cited in one of my end of season pieces, which is like, if you look at their net rating when Kevin Knox was off the floor, they're, they profiled as like a 30 win team. Mm. Um, but the priority this year was to develop Kevin Knox along with the rest of the young players. He was terrible, awful. And then you saw over the last 15 games, guess what? He got a little bit better. Um, I think he set out to do a certain thing this year. The organization set out to do a certain thing this year, and I think they accomplished that. So, yeah, I I personally don't have any buyer's remorse with him. Um, I I wouldn't completely blame someone if they did. I get the X's and O's weren't great. Um, I get, obviously, there's some questions about certain guys that he uh, that he seemed to take a liking to. <laughs> other, other guys that he didn't. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> Whatever could I be? <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm still going with it. The, the JL, what's, what's your uh, review of Fizz, first year Fizz? Oh, man, I kind of uh, err on the side of John. Um, like, I, I I agree, man. Like, it's, listen, we, we set out what we want. We set out with a goal, and to me, 90% of the way, we completed that goal. Like, you know, we still, it still is this weird, murky, what's going to happen with the point guard situation moving forward. That's like the only, that's still like a big cloud over this whole season. Mm-hmm. But all in all, we set out to develop young guys. We set out to give them all the minutes. And that's pretty much what we did. And everybody who's over 27, is gone <laughs> except for Lance Thomas because of that, yeah. <laughs> and it, and we live with the results. It's, it's, it's that cut and dry, and we we growing we're growing through it. And I give Fizz all the credit for you know keeping these guys head in the game yep. throughout the whole season. Like you don't yep. see people skipping through roses like I said earlier when you're the worst team in the entire NBA and people are like it's still okay. Yeah, it's still okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then like the Knicks are getting blown out <laughs> at home for the last game of the season, and the, and normally I'd probably be upset if the bench is still like jovial, but for some reason this season I'm just like, well, yeah, it is what it is. We're we're jovial. We're still celebrating the small victories we have. Can I just jump in real quick mm-hmm. on that? Yes, they got blown out a lot, and the final scores were were God knows were rough all season long. Anybody who watched this team. Uh, 82 games and gold star to you if you did um they fought pretty much every game it was often ugly and they often 
let go, not let go of the rope in the end. They were eventually out talented at some point during the game. Yeah. Yeah. But anybody paying close attention knows this team came out and they played hard for this particular coach from the beginning of, of the season right up until the end. Yep. JB, what, what's your final rep- report card on uh, on Fizz in year one? Yeah, well, first, even to pick up on that point, I mean, that last game, I was watching the bench, and, you know, we saw yesterday everything blow up because, you know, guys are pulling out cell phones on the bench in the playoff game, right? Yeah. But uh, I was watching the Knicks bench, and I just couldn't believe how engaged yep. they were. Like, even, like, Moutier, I know the fan base, we all give him a hard time. But, like, he was literally, like, sitting there, like, hanging on each play. Mm. And to me, it's like – he can do the math. He can read all the rumors. He knows that he probably isn't the only way he comes back is whether he takes, you know, uh, like basically a min contract or if the Knicks just strike out on everybody. So they just say, OK, we'll, we'll bring you back since you won't cost us too much. And yet there he is. He's still, um, you know, engaged in a game. And I think that speaks to Fizdale, what he probably did best this season. And it helps having younger players because this is you know, they're, they're trying to prove something for obviously a lot of them. It's their first time through. So it's a little easier to keep those guys motivated than a bunch of veterans. But you could also say young players aren't veterans. They can get distracted easier. You can have things pop up on, you know, social media, like we saw with the Lakers before they got LeBron. They, Mm -hmm. they obviously had their issue with their young players. Um, so I think he did a really good job with that. Um, I, you know, to me, the only question, and this happens with any coach is when, You know, we talk a lot about the different systems the guys play. There also are different players that perform different under different coaches. They're Mm -hmm. usually more of like the bench role guys because the star players are always going to play well. So you do wonder, like, I don't know, if there's a different coach, is it Frank who took that step forward instead of Moutier? You know, where we knew from the press conference, the intro press conference, like Fizdale and, you know, had an eye on Moutier. So he was able to impact him. Maybe Mm -hmm. someone else impacts Frank. Maybe that's better you know, for the Knicks then impact the Moutier. So I think maybe something like that you can look at, look at, but otherwise it's just really hard to grade them on what yeah. Yeah. we went through this season. You know? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no absolutely, man. And, and I've, I've said from the beginning, I, I want to see Fizz here all four years. I want to see a coach actually ride through their contract, see yep. what a, a talent inf- infusion will look like. You know how he will impact that team. Obviously, I know. You know if you if you look at Fizz in this, you know, game by game on these eighty two games. Yeah, there's going to be a lot to nitpick at. Obviously, the offensive and defensive t- statistics and rankings were atrocious this year. But I mean, I think if you if you look at it from a bird's eye view, as you guys talked about, some of the development of the youngsters, prioritizing the youngsters in terms of the playing time the camaraderie in the locker room. They were still together from one through 82. Um, look at DeAndre Jordan. You know, DeAndre Jordan could have, uh, he could have bailed. He could have asked for his buyout. He, he could have been playing this weekend on, on some team and contributed major minutes. Yeah. He chose to stick around because, you know, he told Fizz that he was going to work with Mitch. He was going to work with some of the young guys. And you saw him kind of be an extension of the coach on the bench and kind of coaching these guys up from the minute he got here. So I think all of that could could be a you know a testament to Fizdale. Yeah, yeah. And, and he knows KD was coming. <laughs> yeah, and, and he knows KD's coming. Well, you know what? I, I just, <laughs> let me pick up on that because yeah. again, he DJ is one of KD's best friends mm-hmm. um, in the league, and the fact that both sides, both the Knicks and DJ, were like, "Yeah, you're going to stick around here till the end." You're, you know, you're going to get a real, we want you to get a full taste of what we think is something good that we're building here. That's, that to me, I mean, again, who the hell knows what's going to happen this summer, but the Mm -hmm. fact that they have that kind of confidence in what they're building, I mean, I'm personally encouraged by that. I could understand having a different viewpoint, but yeah. Yeah, there's an extreme amount of confidence going into this off season. So, <laughs> well, let's see, Let, let's see if anything comes to fruition. How about yeah. some some negatives? How about some some bad and uglies? Um, you know, one of the things that Macri talked about, you know, development in some areas. How, how about Frank? Because it seems like 
you know, whether it was him not being durable enough or him just not playing well enough, seems like Frank took a step back this year. It wasn't the sophomore campaign that any of us would have hoped in, in Frank Nielakina. Um, What's your take on, on that situation and how it plays out going forward? All right, I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> um, so I be, I'm probably the biggest Frank fan um, on here. I, I, I just... I, I love the kid's attitude. I love everything about him. And um, w- even though I think you can look at each individual step and each individual move they made in terms of how it impacted him um, and defend it, it's impossible to look back at the season and say that what they did where he was concerned was the best approach. Um, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know – what the better approach was. Um, and like, you know, we were having, we were going back and forth on this one uh, with actually with Dave early JB uh, yesterday on Twitter about like, listen, Frank was the worst um, shooter in the league this year mm. of among guys who, you know, played significant minutes That's and true. significant games. I mean, it's, it's a fact. Um, how much does that go on him? How much does that go on them? Um, I, I, I just, I don't know if it's a fit with how, with, with what it just seems like, what they're emphasizing, with what it seems like, what his mentality just naturally is. Um, you look at an organization um, like the Spurs and how they, how they do things on the court, and it's just, it's just so much easier to see Frank in that kind of system and, and just thriving there, and I hope I'm wrong. Um, I really do. I hope I'm wrong, um, but that's... Because I still believe in the kid, and I yeah. still think he's going to be a good player. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. I, I want to see work out as well, man. Jay Ellis, what about you, man? Yeah, you know me, CP. I got made fun of all, all year long for defending Frank <laughs> on the on the post-game live show. <laughs> and even when I was like, well, taking your approach and saying, well, Dan, the timing doesn't seem right for, for Frank to really thrive here now, considering where we're at. And it is season, PSJ, Kadeem Mount, and Moutier, um, possibility of getting Kyrie. Um, all these guards here is going to be the two guards who take up his minutes, the, uh, the small forward even. Like, it, to me, with, it just seems like there's too too many obstacles coming into next season for Frank to, you know, get a fit here. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like, I still believe in Frank uh, like you do, but at the same time, it's like, man, this might not be the best situation for him. Like, it really, I, you really have to do, like, a lot of algebra in your mind and shifting around to like, all right. <laughs> which is ironic because on paper given what their goals are this summer he's exactly what they need a low usage player who defends and and makes smart passes on paper he's exactly yeah. the type of player that they should be looking for to fill in the holes on the roster that they hope to have and again i i just i can't shake the nagging feeling that it's yeah. i don't know i, I hope the, i'm wrong not the a one fit. the one thing the one thing that would have kept them on the court was the shooting like if, well, yeah, obviously, yeah. If he, like if he was able to hit threes this season and do everything else he did, and that's all that happened, changes everything. It changes everything completely. And but that never happened. It seemed like glimpses of it was happening in the beginning of the season, and that tapered off. But um, even towards, but right before he got injured, he seemed like he was showing another dimension to his game. The injury happened. Yeah. And that was that's all she wrote. She she played like forty two games. He played half a season. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he, yep. he, just, he literally just played half season. So it's sometimes it's timing and luck sometimes, man. That that's that's part of the game too, man. Like if Frank was healthy in that portion of the game when Moody was hurt, we didn't have to bring up Kadeem Allen to take his place, then who knows what would have happened, but he never got the opportunity because of that annoying grind injury. So Yeah, the yeah. yeah, injury was the worst possible time. And I mean I just think that you know, we know obviously that Frank was picked when what was it, ten days before Phil Jackson was, was gone. Fine, and, yeah. Right. And it was the idea that he is kind of the perfect uh maybe triangle point guard, etc. And we haven't known how invested the guy, you know, Mills being left over and then now Perry are in him. But I, I just think if they do get the free agents that they think they're gonna get, it really just changes the timeline, right? Yeah. So yeah. even if all agree that Frank over time can become a valuable player. 
I mean, you know, you got to be a little honest and say to yourself, okay, we just had a, a season where we essentially were just playing anyone who was young. We weren't expected to win any games and he still, he couldn't make an impact in that environment. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, the whole concept of empty stats is you're playing guys who normally on a good team might not get that same opportunity. So therefore they're able to kind of inflate their numbers a little bit. Well, Frank wasn't able to do that at all this season, right? So I guess the question is, are they going to look at it that way and say, so how do we expect him now to contribute on this winning team where we need a guy to actually hit down, hit an open shot because that might be a shot in the playoffs or, uh, you know, versus having the patience to develop him up. And I just think it changes the timeline if they get those players. And then, you know, there's also some cap implications that if you were to trade them. But I think the negative to me is, you know, they didn't, his value is depressed now. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you could argue this year, I guess going a little bit versus what I just said, this was the year to play him at point guard all the way through, That's not just kind of experiment with him on other positions. Right. So why not? You know, if you had built up his value, then now if you made that same calculation, well, we like him, but we want more win now, guys, you at least have value to trade where it seems like now you're really trading him on a low. And to me, that was kind of the negative is I would have liked to see them turn some of these guys, whether it was Bonley at the trade deadline, um, obviously, like we just said with Frank, even Hazonia, like before the season started, you know, who knew what he would be or not. And obviously he had a good last couple of games. It would have been nice to see them turn any of those reclamation slash young players into higher value trade pieces. Yeah. And I'm not so sure they did that, maybe with the exception of Moutier, but because of Moutier's contract situation, it's really tough to do much with him. Um, that, to me, was probably the biggest negative or disappointment. Yeah, even Vonley. I think we were hoping Vonley could have turned into something. That I know we were we were hot after that Philly uh, second round pick, but we we weren't able to flip Vonley for anything. Uh, Hazonia really, you know, he came on maybe the last three four games, <laughs> rather than uh, you know yeah. much impact over the season. So I, I kind of agree with that. Um, JB or, or JLS, any other things you you would like to see, or or any other negative aspects of this season you'd like to uh, shed light on? There were some people here that was on a one-year deal that you was hoping, uh, mainly Mario. I feel like mainly Mario, I was hoping to see if he took a step or if he can grow. And he was kind of a head scratcher for most of the year instead of like in, until like the end of the season. But um, but I feel like we – I don't know there's a lot of other disappointments in my mind. It's like we came what we came to do. We developed. Um, I know there might be some disappointment as, as far as the coaching – you know, somebody's trying to get more minutes than the other. He prioritized offensive players instead of defensive players. Uh, but overall, it's just like we got the cast base we wanted. Um, we got Mitch. We got um, Trier to look forward to. Knox seemed like he was knocking on the door. Those guys are going to be under contract. And it yeah. seems like for the most part, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, the, the Mario thing, I don't know why I, I'm still, like, intrigued with this guy, man. I, on-ball Mario was was very Talented. intriguing to me, man. Very intriguing to me. I thought he he, he moved the ball well. Um, you know, yeah, he, he had as many turnovers as assists, and, and is, he's certainly a matador on defense a lot of times. But I don't know, man. This guy still intrigues me, even on a on a vet minimum, if he chooses to, to take that and come back next year. Yeah, I wonder if they didn't choose to ship some of these guys away before just to see how cheap they can get them in their, in, uh, you know, if just in case some big name free agents do come and they yeah. say, Hey, well, do you want to come for like a million? And we're still in good standing because we didn't trade you away for, you know, mm -hmm. a pick or something. I wonder if that was the thinking. Yeah. Um, Macri, where are you at on that? I mean, I, I think it's going to be interesting. Um, what a lot of these guys, Mario, you know, Vonley, Moody, a, um, what they decide to do. I I would bet that they had offers for all of those guys, or maybe not Moody, but, but Mario. I think uh, Berman of The Post reported that they had something on the table perhaps for him around the deadline. Um, I, I would be absolutely floored if nobody made an offer for Vonley. And I think they made the calculated decision that they thought it was more important to keep guys here who wanted to be here 
Yeah. Uh, maybe because there haven't been that many of those types of guys mm-hmm. over the years. And now you finally got some guys who have bought in. Um, and I think that's an interesting decision. Um, we'll see if it ends up working out. We'll see if, if any of them um, end up do coming back on like a, a, a bet minimum deal. Um, my guess is that the most likely of those to, to, to do that would be Moody. Um, mm-hmm. I have to think, Someone's gonna pay Vonley a few bucks. Yeah. Um, this yeah. summer and Mario, I, I, if I was another team, like a good team, um, I would take a chance on his own. Um, I would because I think we, I, I don't think what we saw at the end of the year is as real as we maybe wanted it to be. Right. But I don't, I don't think it's completely fake either. So. Right. Yeah, that that's what intrigues me, and and I think given that it is low production all year round, I think. Um, we don't know what his what his market value really is and who's really interested. Yeah. And you know, he's he seems to be all but begging to come back. So, you know, money talks yeah. money talks at the end of the day. But um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be against him on, on the vet minimum. You know. Third string point guard, Mario? Third string point yeah. guard. Well, I was gonna say the thing I guess the reason I'm not as big on Mario as it sounds like you guys are is because mm-hmm. one, he he seems to need the ball in his hands to thrive. Yeah. So if you're on a good team where you have two or three options ahead of him that are going to be high usage players. How is he going to have the ball in his hands? And then two, he doesn't play defense. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's like, there's just a lot of minutes and we've seen he's been inconsistent, right? So there's a lot of minutes where it's like, yeah, if he can, you know, kind of be your point forward, I, you know, I guess if you had the, the right guy, you know, if you were a team built on like star shooters and he could facilitate for them, but I just don't know if you're with a team that's has like a Kyrie type, and then obviously someone like a Durant, it's like, okay, well, where where's Mario going to get these possessions where, yeah. you know, other than in transition, which just doesn't, you know, maybe, you know, if your defense is better, you get more transition opportunities. But I guess that would be my worry, um, you know, I guess with him. But, um, you know, I agree he has some potential still to realize. I just, I guess, like I said, on a team with other star players, I'd worry a little bit where he finds his spot to, you know, to thrive. Uh, absolutely, man. So, so segueing in, into the off season, obviously, this is probably the most important off season in New York Knicks history. Um, between the draft and free agency, we can literally have another season like this, or we could be on a complete opposite trajectory and and talking playoffs and and maybe even beyond. So, starting with the draft, obviously, May fourteenth is the lottery. Fourteen percent chance at the number one pick. Fifty percent chance at number five. Obviously, Zion is the 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 name of the game, the eye on the prize. But um, you know, we got to be realistic in that there, there's other prospects that that we'll have to uh, do some homework on because there, there's a likelihood that that it'll be the field that'll be the Knicks pick rather than Zion. Well, what's your guys' overall take on, you know, how Zion would fit with the Knicks and who's, you know, a prospect maybe one through five that that you've taken a look at um, outside of Zion? JL, I'll start with you, man. Uh, how Zion would fit here? <laughs> <laughs> Look at him just, and Mitch blocking people. <laughs> I just envision him and Mitch flying around <laughs> for the same time swatting anything that comes near the hoop uh, and him passing the ball from half court, bounce pass between somebody's legs for, yeah, I, I, I envision the great things if Zion comes here. Like I, I, I know people kind of worried about him being too short to play power forward and, blah, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I feel like he kind of bully people there. If he's that big, use his sort of strength, bully people, kind of be like a baby Giannis almost at six, six. Me pull out the way and dunk on your face. That's how I feel like we use if we ever get them. But um, that's just me. You know, that's just me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but as far as other prospects, that depends on where we land, man. This is a, after Zion. I mean, I know that Ja is 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 a nice constellation prize. Um, uh, I kind of I'm kind of starting to lean towards Darius. Mm. I'm kind of Darius Garland. Like, interesting. I kind of start like when I start to think of everything together and and like i mean only the only reason why i wouldn't take him is my new Kyrie was coming yeah <laughs> yeah well that's, the that, that's gonna be the difficult thing right uh, i mean yeah. if they land the number two pick 
and they, you know, decidedly go against the point guard, is that an indication that Kyrie's in the bag? I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right. Or, you know, a lot of it has been talked about with Anthony Davis, if they land the number one pick, you know, do you use that? Well, maybe it's more a question if they don't land the number one pick. And then, like you said, if you if you're now drafting someone who um, isn't the best player available, but more for fit, mm-hmm. does it make sense to trade back yeah. and maybe use that pick to, again, add other pieces around, you know, what you're building? So, yeah, if they don't win, it's funny. A lot of the, I guess it's just funny. A lot of the talk has been if they win the first pick, do you keep it or trade it for an AD if that's possible? But to me, I think the decisions come if they don't win it. Yeah. What do you do? Because, you know, now it's not as like a premium player guaranteed. Right. That I think I would like, trade back. <laughs> you, you would trade back? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, three, uh, three, I might trade back after two. <laughs> yeah. I guess it depends on the, on who who's behind us, right? Like if Phoenix is behind us and, and they're hot after Morant, you know, let's say we get yeah, second right. or, or we get third. Uh, maybe it could maybe a worthwhile um trade. Matt Macri, what's your take on, you know, the your draft scenarios uh, and strategy going forward? Um it's just really interesting to me because I think at the at this point you you could argue that the three um most high ceiling players in the draft um three guys who if you probably were betting today you would bet would go one two and three in some order would be zion uh john morant and and rj barrett Mm -hmm. and the interesting thing that all three of them have in common is they all are players that um profile at least at 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 this point as someone who needs the ball to be effective Mm -hmm. and you know part of what i mean i'm obviously not the first person to say this part of what makes golden state so effective is yes, they have a big four, but two of those guys don't need the ball at all. Oh, yeah. to, to, I don't think Zion needs the ball though. I to me, I think he to, he does because he's just not a shooter. He's right not now. a shooter, yeah. And neither is Morant, and and neither is Barrett. Um, so you know, the, and here's the really interesting thing. So they have the Knicks. I mean, they have kind of messaged that regardless of who signs in free agency, they are not going to divert from the overall larger organizational plan of, you know, essentially taking the best guys um, and trying to get the best people in here talent wise and molding them, you know? Mm. So if that's really the case, um, how did, I mean, even if they do have an indication that, you know, Kyrie and Durant are both in the bag, does that mean that they trade out of the second or third pick down to, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 and get like a, um, you know, um, like a Hunter or Mm -hmm. like even a Clark from, from uh, Gonzaga Gonzaga, guys, guys who are a little bit more further along, maybe could, uh, they're obviously more effective on defense than a lot of those guys at the top. Well, other than Zion, I guess. Um, I don't know. I I think they're, you know, it's funny. We've praised Perry and Scott um, uh, and Steve Mills, excuse me, a lot over the last year and change. And they and we have every right to praise them, but there have there has not been a lot of downside with anything they've done. Even the Porzingis trade, even the Porzingis mm-hmm. trade, it was like they were against a rock and a hard in between a rock and a hard place, and they got a good return. Now it's when there starts to be real, cognizable, oh, yeah. tangible downside to certain decisions. Oh yeah. So um, it's going to be really, really interesting. I I I don't envy the position they're in and. I just wish the draft was after free agency because I would. <laughs> oh, I would love for that. I've been Black preaching player, that. Man. I've been, I've been preaching that man all year because it, it just makes uh, your decisions so much easier. Um, yep. Although you know, some people may just say you know you have to draft based on you know. Uh, the best play available for your team, and and worry about free agency later on. I know yeah. I, I I had mentioned that to Alan Hahn, and I called up a show, and, and that was his take: is that you, you just got to go um, with who's the best for your team in the draft, and, and worry about free agency later on. Um, but my take on the draft, I think, I don't know. I I like this kid John Morant a lot, man. And, and just yeah. looking at our offensive futility, not just this year, but just over the past few years, man. Especially you know this year, offensive rating in the tank. Um, assist numbers in the tank, passing out of the pick and roll, execution out of the pick and roll in the tank. This guy just seems tailor-made 
um, to, to improve this team leaps and bounds. He just seems like the point guard that we truly need. Now, of course, I would take Kyrie Irving. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I, I don't see how you pass on John Morant. You know, I would even take him. And if Kyrie comes, you know, you, you figure it out later on. Yeah. You, you figure well, no, it out later on, man. Especially because, like, we know it takes, you know, the whole Kevin Knox. He's only 19 was the hashtag, right? Like, yeah. it takes these guys time. So it might not be the worst thing that, you know, they come and they don't have to be the main person. You could give them a couple years to develop. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's there. But I was just looking to remind myself. I mean, Atlanta, they got five picks in this mm. draft. It could be, as it's slated now, they'd have the fifth and the ninth from Dallas. Yeah. So it's, like, you know, if you're trading back, you know, that, especially when you think of these guys sort of in tears, like you wonder, yeah. like, okay, you know, if you get like the second pick, could you get two picks? Like, say, D- Dallas pick falls like 10 11. Um, you know, to me, that's that's what would be intriguing, and that's, that's the thing to look at. Yeah. And that's why the lottery, even if they don't get the first pick, is important because you could see some team. I don't know about Atlanta, but you could see some team talking themselves into R.J. Barrett. Yeah, at, like this is a guy who's going to score, you know, twenty five points a game for us for you know eight years or whatever. Like you could you could talk. I, I don't. I personally don't really have a, a strong opinion on him, but I could see someone having one. Yeah. I think I'm nervous about Barrett, which is why if I had, if I had three, I probably would trade now. I'm like, he makes me nervous a little bit. Like his jump shot seems so all over the place. And I yeah. know, you know, that's things you can fix. But um, I don't know this the, the jump shooting combined with the foul shooting to me is just like it, it just seems like it's, it's going to be a long road to fix that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought, you know, overall his tournament play was a bit up and down. You know, definitely I agree with you, JLS. His jumper and his free throw shooting definitely left a lot to be desired. But I feel like those things can be improved upon. I think I like I, I like his competitive will. I like his ability to facilitate. He can certainly do that. I think he can rebound the ball as well. So I think offensively he is a bit versatile in that regard. But, you know, you just want to see the shooting numbers improve yeah. a little bit. Absolutely, man. Personally, I wouldn't mind if we ended up with Culver. I'll just throw that out there. Yeah, I like I like Culver too. I like. Culver. I mean, yeah. he's, if you look at this team and how they were this year, I mean, putting everything else aside, you want to talk about a guy that's kind of tailor made for what it seems like the Knicks um, need with this particular group. I, I think it's probably Culver. So. Yeah, I, I thought Culver had an outstanding tournament. Yeah. I mean, he basically he led them to the championship. He he was solid, he man. He, he was. His solid. blow by speed though concerns me, but I do like like other assets of his game. Like, I, yeah. Uh, and he has like that will to win. He just seems like he hit a nice jumper yep. when he when he needs to. Mm-hmm. But then it seems like his athleticism has him limited sometimes in what he can do, especially when uh, the game is online. <laughs> so time will tell, man. So moving forward, so we touched on the draft. Lastly, let's touch on um, free agency. JB, we know July first is yep. Judgment Day for the Knicks. Will these rumors come through to fruition? Will the Vucevic era begin hopefully not <laughs> hopefully not in orange and blue yeah, yeah. you know but um let's let's just talk about you know real real briefly just a survey of you know what the cap space is looking like if the best case scenario which i would say label as the two match free agents whichever one of the four k's you want to put together if right. that best case scenario comes to fruition you know what type of space are we dealing with here who could be impacted by potential roster moves and, you know, how else can we fortify this team to make it a a true competitor? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I guess dove toving, I dove toving, (laughs) dove (laughs) tailing. That was my moment of the season right there. There you Um, go. I love it. uh, And I don't even really know. I guess I'd have to even think about what that even means. All these sayings (laughs) are just in your but um, off the lottery is important because it is sort of ironic where, you know, obviously you want the Knicks to get the number one pick. That is the most important thing. You can always create more cap space, moving someone like Frank, Dennis Smith Jr., whatever you need to do. They they will have space to sign two max free agents. And it's not just two max because Kevin Durant is a 10 plus year veteran. His max is a little bit higher. So they will have enough to sign both Durant and whoever that second star is. But if they don't win the lottery and you end up with, say, the second pick, the difference between the second and the fifth pick is, you know, does impact your cap a little bit because the salary, what it is, is when you 
draft a, when you have a draft pick, that draft pick doesn't count anything against your salary until the draft. But then once you draft them, they count for 120% of their rookie scale. So for someone like Zion, that's actually $9.7 million that goes against your cap once yeah. you draft him. Hmm. For the fifth pick, and I'm looking, yeah, so it's $6.3 million for the fifth pick. So that's like a $3.5 million difference, which is coincidentally about what someone like Alonzo Trier's club option would be. So I guess what I'm getting at is if you don't win the lottery, you still want the highest pick because that has the most value, but you just have to keep in mind that it does impact who they can bring back. And the way that I've calculated it out, if they wanted to keep both all of the young guys, so Frank, uh, Desmond Jr., Knox, Mitch, but then also Dotson and Trier, they would only be able to do that if they got the fifth pick in the lottery, mm. assuming the cap is actually $109 million exactly. Mm. So the, the point being, if they don't, if they end up with like the second pick, they're going to have to move some salary if they then want to sign the two max players and also bring Dotson and Trier back. Obviously, Dotson's a lot easier because he's basically making the men. Yeah. But it, they just have to guarantee it. But really, it comes down to Trier. If they want to bring him back, they're going to have to make a decision. And to me, it comes down to probably him or Frank. And it might be they kind of they kind of landscape what the trade market is and they see what can they get for each. Cause remember they can't, they can't technically trade Trier until they exercise his club option, mm. but they could do that and then trade them. So if they got a decent return for one of those guys, maybe that's what they do. And then that gives them the cap space to keep all the other young guys. But you know, to me, the summary is they have enough space to keep Frank Densmith Jr. Knox, Mitch, two max free agents, mm -hmm. They then will have the room exception around $5 million and then all of the vet mins. That's basically what they have. But if you want to add in Dotson, Trier, someone else, that's where you get into moving someone like Frank or I don't know if Dennis Smith Jr. You, you, know, you might have to do that to get an extra three to $4 million to, um, to make it all work. That, that is going to be interesting, mm. man. That is going to be interesting, Jails. Woo! So, the, no, so the decision on ISO is going to be June twentieth, same date Jeez. as the draft, right? Right. They'll have to decide if they pick up that option at three point five million. So, so you expect if you won the first picks, um, someone's going to be more than likely traded it's on draft. Be moved. Exactly. I think if they get the first pick, hmm. then it creates an issue where unless you you um, you know, you just didn't want, like those players anyways, so you weren't worried about get, losing Trey or, or Dotson or players like that. That's one thing. But I think I'm thinking they like Trier. I mean, Fizdale's already said, I think, that he plans on having him play in Summer League. I don't think yeah. he's saying it yeah. about the option. But I just think if they get the first pick because that takes up so much cap space, it means that someone like Frank is almost certainly it's gone. Probably gone. Mm -hmm. He's gone. That cap space, and they like I think Trier more than Frank. And that yeah. and that's how much savings would that be if if they traded Frank? How much like, snap would you get back? Yeah, it's like four and a half million around there. Four four point four if million. You, so if you trade Frank, you could have everybody else back, even if you get the number one pick. It's exactly. Right. That's what makes it. That's what makes it easy for him. How much is the uh, the vet minimum? Well, it Roughly. depends on years of service. So, okay, okay. you know, if you're like, a, you know, a first or second year player, it's around a million and a half, but it can go up to, I want to say it's like 2.7, around 3 million, but, but you can sign unlimited amount of vet minimums. And they also, like I said, will have that room exception. That's the one exception they'll have left. Um, it's about four or with, five million. Yeah. About four and a half, five million dollars. So that once you max out your space, so for instance, in Trier, you could theoretically get the number one pick, sign the two max players, decline the option on Trier, but then bring them back for more money under the room exception. Mm -hmm. So you could go and or fit Trier and Dotson under under that amount, right? I mean, Dotson right. makes so little. I think he if they want him back, he's going to be back. I'm not worried about him. It's really Trier. Mm -hmm. And um, so they could go that route, but they could say, we want to use that room exception to get a veteran who's willing to take less money. That's how I would use it. Players. That that's how mm -hmm. I would use it. I think that would have to. If you're talking best case scenario with two max, that room exception has to be used with somebody that can be, you know, a third or fourth guy that you can kind of rely on. You know, a shooter, from, a shooter, a shoot. Yeah, please, three so point shooter. In, 
unless KD coming here is contingent on Jordan uh, also staying, in which case you're you're probably that you're, that's what uh, it's used on. That's right. What it's used I mean, on. the thing that's crazy is you could kind of make the argument that if you assume you can, whether it's Trier or someone else, you could get for around like three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. Difference between picking first and fifth is also the difference between getting maybe one extra player under the cap without having to and then you could argue like you're moving someone like a frank you could technically move for like another player it doesn't have to just be for a draft pick to clear up the yeah. cap space so in a weird way it's like yeah still zion is obviously worth it all but you got to consider if they fall the fifth it gives them a little more space where they actually would be able to keep maybe one extra player it's like you're getting the fifth pick and a three and a half million dollar player versus just the first pick right Okay. So, so with that being said, last question I'll, I'll post to you guys is, you know, Perry and, and Mills in, the, in their letter to the season ticket holders and, and their overall message all year was that, you know, they're not going to skip steps by any means. But if we, if let's say this best case scenario comes to fruition and let's say you land the, the, the third, the fourth, the fifth pick and you end up keeping it, do you see... Because I, I, I still don't see, once again, I still don't see the, the the clocks aligning between bringing in a Kevin Durant and a Kyrie Irving, best case scenario, to pair with this young team. Because, yes, we'd, we'd be excited to have them. Yes, you know, obviously it, it, we, we'd increase our win totals. But where would that really lead to? You, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Matt Macri, go, go ahead on that one. I, I, I think they... I, again, I don't know if this is wise. I think they believe they could have their cake and eat it too. Um, I, I think they believe that the young guys that they have on the roster took enough steps forward this year. Um, and also that anybody coming here um, would have just enough patience um, to – um, allow the thing to play out as they see it potentially playing out. Um, the other, the other part of it, I just want to toss in here. And again, JB could speak to this probably better than I can just based on the money. If you look throughout the league and you're like, okay, you know what? Um, let's go a different direction. We have Durant, we have Kyrie or Kemba or Jimmy Butler, whoever um, we need to make some trades. We need to trade, let's say a Kevin Knox or um you know, a Smith Jr. or um, or our draft pick or something for someone who could help us win now. Well, guess what? There aren't a whole lot of guys around the league who would be able to fit into that type of salary slot because all these kids are making no money. And if you look around the league at guys who, who the Knicks would theoretically want to target, you're talking about someone who's definitely going to be better than these kids are going to be next year. So obviously you're talking about your Bradley Beals of the world and, and, and guys of that, of that nature, hmm. that's not going to work money wise unless right. you trade a literally bunch, a bunch of people every, unless you trade everything. And yeah. even then it's like, it's not even financially feasible. JB, correct me if I'm wrong, unless you get the first pick. Yeah. So then it looks at, then you could start to look at like, all right, well, are there any guys making not a lot of money that I could exchange? Like, not a whole lot out there. Yeah. I mean, like, th does trading for like a DJ Augustine excite you? And like, would would the Magic even want to do that? Do you want to call up Atlanta and see if they want to um, trade you um, Torian Prince? Mm. Is, is he going to be that much better next year than Kevin Knox would be next year? It's like, look, I trust me. I've looked at literally every roster, every salary cap in the league. There is not a trade out there that makes sense where it's like, all right. We send out a young player, take back someone that's not making a lot of money, but that is also someone that is definitely going to help us win next year. I I think they're just going to – that's one of the reasons I think they're just going to roll with, even if they, they hit a home run this Hope summer. For the best. They're still going to go with these kids, yeah. 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 Mm. JL, sounds like Macri's greasing the wheels for, for a mellow return on the cheap, man. <laughs> that, that, that's, what, that's what all that's that prognosticating awesome. sounded like to me, man. But you, you be the judge, JL. So you weigh in on this one, man. On, on, on a mellow just, just overall, just, just overall, um, you know, looking at this roster, if you do that best case scenario and you have these two max players, you know, how do you pair that with these young guys? Is it asking a lot from a Knox to take a huge leap in his sophomore year? Is it asking a lot for even a Mitch to take a, another huge step to really get this team 
to a point where they can actually, you know, make some noise or even just to make the playoffs and, and you know. Well, I have my tears. Like, my tier is the guys who have confidence in that can actually do something next season and probably contribute is probably, to me, uh, Mitch, Dotson, Trier. To, the, to me, those three guys, I'm fairly confident that they can contribute uh, to a winning team next season. Um, Knox, you just don't know. <laughs> you saw you saw a sign towards the end of the year, but Knox is a is a wild card. So um, to answer your question, yeah, I, I, everybody and, and and those are the guys who most likely will be here next season anyway. So I mean, yeah, that, I guess that's my answer. Yeah. I don't know, just, just, you know, interest, just interesting to look at because I just feel like if you bring these guys in here, um, yes, we'll be excited. But the pressure is going to be immense. You know, the pressure is going to skyrocket. And so that's what I'm just, you know, the negative Nancy and me as a Knicks yeah. fan is just always looking at those downsides, you know? Yeah, I feel you. But best case scenario, Kyrie, Dotson, uh, Mitchell Robinson, Zion, KD, sorry, if I, I think we'll manage. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. You, you're asking for a Zion, man. But absolutely, man. Best case scenario, I think we'll manage. The only thing I would say is, I would hope somebody between Zion and Mitch actually develops a jump shot next season because I don't know if you can have two players in the court at the same time. You can't shoot. Yeah. Um, Not spacing the floor. Yep. Yeah, for for, for sports floor spacing purposes. Mm-hmm. Uh, if to me that's all the way best case scenario. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, to me too, it's what does, what are the conversations they have with someone like Durant and Kyrie, right? Like we, we will see, you know, whenever Woj or whoever tweets it in July third or something, like what Durant signed decides to do, but we don't know. Like, does he say to the Knicks, like, look, I'm coming here, but you know, kind of like a LeBron situation. This is what I want around me, and I think that's going to be the. We were talking about the fan base is for the most part on the same page right now with the organization, to me, the next big sort of debate might be, you know, if they actually get these guys, what we're talking about now, what do you do and how much are they um, committed to making a move? Cause they told someone like Durant, they would. Um, I think Maggie's right. Like, especially with Mitchell Robinson. I mean, he's making his, his contract is so good going forward. It's just really, you got to get a lot of value. To me, I think if they're able to make the money work and New Orleans is willing to do it, I 100% think the Knicks would trade for Anthony Davis. Mm. Mm. But outside of something like that, I don't, I think like, you know, it, it gets a little tricky, but it's just like I said, how much does someone like Durant or Kyrie influence their thinking and say, you know, sorry, I can't win with this guy. I want this guy. And they say, all right, well, we're giving you everything. We're giving Rich Kleiman a job. We're giving you the role players you want. Just yeah. come here. I don't know how much that might influence it. But I do think if they can get Anthony Davis, I think they will. I don't think they're going to say, no, we'd rather just develop all these young guys. I think they will. They wouldn't pass on putting those three together. Anthony Davis, Durant, and Kyrie, if they can figure it out. So you would trade Zahn for Anthony Davis and... Probably. See, I don't, I don't know if I like. I have to think about it some more because it has been a big debate all season, right? But it's just right. like, um, it's it's just, not up to. Couldn't... It's not even going to be up to them. It's going to be up to Durant. Yeah. If Durant says that's jump, it. guess what? Yeah. How high? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. It's... That, I guess that's what I'm getting at. Is I think that's going to be the biggest impact here. I think as fans, we can say, you know, the value of Mitch and how we like building these young players. I just think the the negative maybe of when you're living in this free agent world is you then have to make some promises and you then have to do things that, you know, maybe you don't want to do, but I don't know, like, look at these, we just saw these top seeds other than Milwaukee, you know, struggling early. Like, so are you telling me if you had Durant Kyrie and Anthony Davis and whoever you put around them, I mean, are they coming out of the East next year? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, so, I think that's so. a, <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's a, yeah, man. How do you say no to that? Yeah, you, you really can't. You got to go hard to go home, man. Like they say, scared money don't make money, man. So <laughs> I love that quote. I I, I guess uh, we we would have to do it, man. But um, yeah, just just wrapping up. You know, I, first off, first and foremost, man, I just want to say uh, thank all of you guys, man. It's been a great year. 
Um, you know, we try to bring as much value to the channel, as much value to to the show, to the watch as, as much as possible. And uh, I know a lot of people learn a lot for you guys. I definitely learn a lot for you guys. So thanks a lot for for thank um, you, CP, man. Yeah, thank you, guys, thank yeah. you for doing what you do. What like seriously, I I go on for a couple minutes at the end of these games, and you you guys are on there for a while. Dedication, man. Ded- dedication, <laughs> man. It, it's, no, and that's it. awesome. And yeah. like. So it, people just want to like talk about shit and you I'm give them that you. platform and I just, that's awesome. And you should really, uh, I, I, congratulations to you on, uh, I think it, it was a really good season. Very good season, man. The watch parties and, and everything, you know, we're, we're growing a real nice network here. So, uh, you know, continue, you know, good success and, and, and good luck with everything, man. So as we close typical final 30 seconds, um, JL, so I'll, I'll go to you first. Uh, just, right. just give, give the people your final thoughts and, and where to find you, man. Um, final thoughts in Ninja PV trust. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all in for Ninja. Oh, new, oh, new name to name alert. Uh, I'm all in for Ninja P and Fizz Dad. Fizz Dad. <laughs> Fizz Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, right. man. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you can find uh, you know, the podcast, Nick and Time Show. Drops every Tuesday on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, all that stuff. And Wednesdays on YouTube. So definitely check me out there. And um, yeah, that's it, man. I'll see you next show, CP, whenever we do a next post game. I'll check you out. And um, yeah, man, that's it. Uh, Love you guys. Man. Absolutely, man. Appreciate it, bro. Uh, JB, you're up. Yeah, no, just if you went over to uh, the Twitter account at Nick Film School. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter because now that it's off season, obviously yep. there's not a lot of content, but we'll be pulling together all the, you know, the rumors and news and uh, also writing. I think before we just kind of focused on, if you subscribe before, just focused on kind of what has happened. Uh, but we're going to try to add in almost like mini articles into the newsletter. So make sure you subscribe to that. Like I said, you can just go to the Twitter profile. Um, but otherwise, no, just thanks for everyone. Thanks to you guys. It's been a fun year. I mean, we're doing this when the team is bad. So I'm hoping next year, uh, you know, we played the foundation that, you know, when oh, they're yeah. actually, uh, it'll be a big difference. It'll be fun. So looking forward to doing more stuff soon. Absolutely, man. Appreciate it, JB. Okay, Macker, you're up, man. I just want to say for the record that as a Nick fan who has gone through so much misery over the last 20 years, I am scared shitless that it is now <laughs> my Durant to the Knicks is like a fate accompli and I just I want to say that and I just want to get that out there nothing has ever scared me more than the fact that it is now almost like it's an acknowledged thing like we don't have to worry about uh, yeah. it coming for sure because I felt that kick in the nuts before, and it is not fun. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I'm I'm right there with you, man. The the, the confidence level is sky high, and and I am nervous. I Just am so. nervous, man. But uh, good problems to have, man. So once again, fellas, appreciate you guys for joining us for, for giving us your time. Uh, for those of you that are watching, leave a comment in the comment section below with the timestamp for the topic that most appealed to you and what you want to comment on. And once again, man, thanks again for the support. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.